Welcome to my talk. Um, today I present Spinnaker 2, an energy efficient real-time neuromorphic compute system in 22 FDX technology. And this is a joint work from our group at Technische Universität Dresden in Germany and the group of Steve Ferber at the University of Manchester. And this is uh, done within the Human Brain Project. First, I will give you a brief overview about the Spinnaker architecture. And then in the main part of the talk, we'll focus on the Spinnaker 2 hardware and finally highlight some application examples that use new hardware features. Um, the idea of Spinnaker is to build a processing system which is inspired by brain-like signal processing or brain-like computation. And therefore, a processing is required, which basically is updating synapses and updating weights and calculate neuron states. Then, of course, communication is required, which is about sending spikes in an address event-based uh, representation scheme. And then, of course, it's storage. It's storing the synaptic weights, which then is the memory of the system. And it's also about modeling delays and, and neuron states. When we have a look at some typical, uh, it's called this uh, workload scenario, where neurons, which are plotted here, send spikes, we see that we have a very dynamic uh, workload scenario where phases with high update rates or high spike rates um, occur, but at uh, other longer times during the application, there are low update rates and um, therefore very, very uh, low uh, spike rates and low computation load required. And our compute system must take advantage out of this to, at the end, realize a system which uh, operates at very high energy efficiency. At, at the end, of course, uh, one target for Spinnaker is to realize this in biological real time, which means with less than one millisecond, or maybe for an advanced version, also 0.1 millisecond uh, latency for processing and communication. The Spinnaker system, as some of you might know, is a, a communication and memory-centric architecture for the efficient real-time simulation of neural networks and has been developed by Steve Ferber in Manchester. It's a many-core approach, ARM-based. Uh, on the Spinnaker 1 chip, there are 18 cores per chip. And out of these chips, larger systems, such as these 48 node boards with nearly 900 processors, are built. Spinnaker has a broad user base. There are more than 40 systems operational in research labs around the world. It's flexible, uh, it's adaptable due to the software approach to neuron models, uh, plasticity models, and uh, the feature of real-time operation makes it suited for robotics and it's thereby faster than uh, any high-performance compute approach. Uh, but the Spinnaker system uses a somehow old technology, uh, so there's room of improvement with two aspects. Uh, first, of course, there's always the chance to use, uh, use Moore's law to scale and implement the second generation on a more modern process. Here we use the 22 FDX process, where I will explain some details later. And on top of this, of course, it's about uh, innovative circuit techniques which are to be employed here to, on top of the technology scaling, enhance throughput and energy efficiency. And the target is to uh, have at least a 10x scaling uh, for the Spinnaker 2 compared to Spinnaker 1, with the target at the end, uh, depending on how you calculate scaling, to fit the compute and memory capacity of such board to a single chip of Spinnaker 2. Our roadmap of Spinnaker 2 that we follow within the Human Brain Project is sketched here, starting from the Spinnaker 1 system, which is uh, scaled up to one million core machine located in Manchester. There are parallel activities with silicon prototypes of Spinnaker 2, which at the end uh, should lead to a Spinnaker 2 chip, which approximately has 144 ARM cores, uh, some uh, hardware uh, assistance for the spike-based communications, like, for example, the Spinnaker router. And this chip is then to be manufactured. And at the end, the Spinnaker 2 system uh, shall be constructed, which is targeted to simulate uh, brain size point neuron networks. Uh, now some details on the Spinnaker 2 hardware. Um, the Spinnaker 2 chip, at the end, is a chip that you see as, uh, yeah, as a chip when you use this. But inside, there is this processor die with LPDDR4 memory stacked on top in a package-on-package -package approach. And this chip is a homogeneous uh, many-core system 
which, is, uh, which contains 144 ARM M4F cores, which are organized in these quad processing elements, which are then arranged in this tile-like fashion here, and communicate over a network on chip, always to the nearest neighbor. And each uh, quad PE contains of four processing elements, PE, which then contains the ARM core, local memory, and there are some other features like, for example, synchronous nearest neighbor connection for memory sharing between the PEs. So at the end, the system is a resource which contains local memory with respect to SRAM. You can see this on the layout picture here. Approximately 80% of the silicon area are occupied by SRAM, so you can see this as an SRAM chip, and the other parts are then occupied by the logic. And uh, now we work on some scenarios how to utilize this uh, fabric consisting processing and memory um, in an optimized way for energy efficient neural network simulation. Therefore, the uh, processing element, which is uh, uh, constructed around the ARM Cortex M4F, is equipped with additional hardware features. And uh, I, with this slide, I want to list them, and then we go into some details of some of the hardware features. At first, we support dynamic power management uh, in terms of dynamic voltage frequency scaling and power shutoff by means that the processing element logic can connect to one out of two supply rails on the chip that operate at different voltages, very low voltages, as you can see here, and of 0.6 volt and down to 0.45 volt. Then we have, as I said, uh, synchronous memory sharing possibilities, so each PE can synchronously access the memory of its neighbor. This makes some flexibility in using the local SRAM, which is 128 kilobytes per PE, so we have 512 kilobytes per quad compared to the processing uh, resources that we have. Then we have some hardware accelerators. There is a multiplayer accumulate accelerator, which has a DMA included, so that can run autonomously multiplayer accumulate operations for machine learning. There are special hardware accelerators focused on neuromorphics, which are, for example, exponential and logarithm functions. There are random number generators that also support true random numbers, which are extracted from the noise of the on-chip PLA clock generators. For on-chip communication, we have a network on-chip, and the whole logic of the PE is controlled by adaptive body biasing. So what's adaptive body biasing? Um, we have chosen the Global Foundries 22 FDX technology to implement Spinnaker 2. And this uh, FDSOI technology has the feature of body biasing, where you can control the threshold voltage of the transistor by applying a voltage from the back gate. So this is the first node of the transistor device. And by controlling this during operation, uh, we can adaptively compensate for process uh, supply voltage and temperature variations and thereby enable ultra-low voltage operation with high yield down to 0.4 volt. So, and the idea is, for example, when you have as reference point a scenario where no bias voltage is applied here or these uh, backgate nodes are tied to ground, there is a very, very bad worst case performance. So the x-axis of this plot shows the performance here in terms of frequency in worst speed conditions, like for example, minus 40C, a VDD minus 10%. And when we go for adaptive body biasing, in this scenario, we can adaptively increase the voltage, thereby reduce the threshold voltage of the device and bring the performance up, up to 9x. The question is, why don't we do this all the time in a static fashion? Yeah, because if we have a worst case leakage condition, which is, for example, a fast process, a hot temperature, and a higher supply voltage, these fixed bias conditions would have a very high overhead with respect to leakage, because in these conditions, we can actively increase the threshold voltage and thereby reduce 75% of the leakage. So this adaptive body bias features gives us guaranteed timing and power under extreme ultra-low voltage conditions. So why do we need these conditions? Um, before implementing our first test chips, we performed a lot of PPA, power performance area analysis, and these were based on synthesis and place and route studies and then power analysis for typical neuromorphic workloads. And these highlighted or showed that there is a minimum energy point, which is around 0.5 volt, which gives us the maximum energy efficiency uh, for this type of uh, operation. And 
On the other hand, we want to scale for performance, and there might be a problem because 250 megahertz is not that fast. The current Spinnaker version runs at 200 megahertz. So how to get uh, this solved? Yeah, the solution is dynamic voltage frequency scaling. Uh, we support two supply voltage levels, one at the optimum energy point and one at the higher performance level, in this case at 0.6 volt. And this is done with a neuromorphic dynamic voltage and frequency scaling scheme where each core supports a fine-grained uh, DVFS scheme where the core can self-trigger, so only knowing its local workload decide at which performance level to operate. And then we have this integrated MAC accelerator, as I said, you. this is basically a um, multiply accumulate array of 16 by 4 MAX, which can upload uh, convolutions and matrix multiplications from the CPU. And when operating this at this minimum energy point, we uh, now assume to get energy efficiencies of up to 6.4 teraops per watt for Spinnaker 2, which makes this really interesting for mobile uh, applications that support machine learning. And now two applications examples uh, which uh, highlight the benefits of this hardware uh, architecture. The first one is, has a nice heading. It's DVS with DVFS, so it's that dynamic vision sensor with dynamic voltage frequency scaling. And the idea is that when we uh, connect an event-based camera that uh, sends spikes or events if a pixel uh, intensity changes, we can use this for dynamic frequency scaling. And there is a, a short video highlighting this. Uh, what happens is that uh, this is a scenario where the, uh, the, where the, in, in the position of the hand is tracked here, and we see for uh, if the number of events increases while the hand is moving, this green line shows the number of events and therefore the computation time required. We see that the processor automatically clocks up to a higher performance level and thereby on average reduces the total power consumption by a factor of four because most of the time it's operating at its minimum energy point. Um, and this is, of course, uh, a scenario which can be used for various aspects of neural network simulations, also a lot of uh, biological relevant scenarios. Uh, the last example I want to show you is uh, another research activity we have. Um, we work together with some uh, theory groups in the Human Brain Project that also work on a theory of these networks. And this example shows a deep rewiring approach which is a deep network which is completely mapped to SRAM, which of course then has a limited memory footprint. And the idea is not only to do the inference on the chip, but also the training. And therefore this deep rewiring approach uses a stochastic synaptic sampling approach, which limits the total number of connections during training and randomly generates new uh, connections uh, based on the training, uh, let's say, or the, the improvement of the training. And thereby we can show on these hardware prototypes that a network trained completely on the local SRAM has approximately 100x energy uh, reduction compared to training this on, an, uh, on a classical CPU while achieving, of course, with the trained network a similar performance. And details can be found in uh, one of our latest publications, which can be then found in the appendix of the slides. Okay. Um, to conclude my talk, uh, I've presented uh, some aspects of Spinnaker 2 which is an energy efficient digital many core systems targeted for neuromorphics. And it's motivated by a mixture of approaches. So we are processor based, which gives a lot of flexibility for updates of learning rules, synaptic and neuron models and so on. But we use uh, accelerators to enhance performance and uh, have an approach for low voltage near threshold operation at minimum energy point, which is enabled by adaptive body biasing. And this idea of event-driven operation and energy proportional computation is uh, followed with respect to this dynamic voltage frequency scaling approach I've presented. Yes, and the end is, of course, to integrate this to uh, Spinnaker 2, which then scales to more than 10x, maybe 100x, and give you the performance of this board in a small chip with less than one watt of power footprint. Okay, thanks to our Spinnaker 2 team, and our industry partners, and then thank you for your attention. So we're gonna take a few questions now. Anyone else?
So he detailed about 10 to the minus 8 joules per synaptic event for energy. Hmm? Um, what specifically is happening? The neuron is, in, is instantiated in CMOS, correct? So the neuron is in software. The, okay. in, the neuron state is calculated by the processor. So there is a, a Spinnaker 2 approach is to decouple the hardware architecture from the biological topology of the network. So okay. in contrast to any other, other neuromorphic hardware, there is no synapse array and no, let's say, topology that matches the neural network in the real uh, CMOS logic. So it's, yeah, it's software based. Hi, can you talk a little bit more about the software API? How do you program it and how do you get to it? It's like, do you expose it to typical frameworks? Yes, yes, yeah. So um, maybe. So the idea is, of course, to uh, this system is different to, to other approaches since it has no operating system, for example. You, sim you dump these uh, neuromorphic simulation kernels to the processors. And the idea is that within the human brain project, there is a higher level software stack constructed where the user has a high level access. And the current access which is supported is PyNN. This is a Python extension for spiking neural, spiking neural networks with a software flow for mapping the, the problem to the processor array. In the future, we will also support some machine learning uh, frameworks like TensorFlow. Yes, but there's a high level access for users. So currently, it's, of course, the user can program the core on the low level software, but the more convenient way is to use the high level software flow to map your spiking network to the chip. So if, you, if your neuron is in software, but I saw Crosspoint and SRAM. Mm -hmm. What's the use of the Crosspoint and SRAM if your neuron is all an operation software, a spike neuron, as you mentioned? So the local SRAM, yeah, okay. Yeah, a... no, not the local SRAM, you, you had all the, 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 uh, the... DRAM, you mean? See there, all the blue SRAM, please go back one. This one, yeah? Uh, no, one, one before that. Before it. Mm -hmm. uh, after, I, I after, 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 yeah, after, yeah. After, yeah. There, there it is. So you have a, a crossbar and mm -hmm. then SRAM. So I, I'm a little bit confused if, if, if uh, the crossbar will be just synapses, I guess, and then you dump into the no, SRAM. No, no, no. no. This so is what's the, the crossbar? No, no, this, this, is the, this is just the microcontroller. This is the local SRAM attached to the microcontroller. This is a 128 kilobyte of SRAM, and this can be then shared between data memory and instruction memory, and you map to the, this is the memory that stores the local software in the data. And there is flexibility to use this. For example, you can use the system without the core and store here some uh, synaptic weights, which then, for example, the machine learning unit uses. Oh, so it's just so. So this, 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 as I said, this is something like an SRAM resource together with some computational resources, and the crossbar brings in flexibility. So in this particular uh, uh, chip, uh, w how many neurons do you really have? I mean, if it's all software. So the plan is with the target performance to map like 1,000 neurons per core in real time, which is 144K neurons per chip. And they scan the spike neuron kernel? Yes. So one last question. Uh, could you just tell us uh, something about the progress in manufacturing? You, you, I think you referred to a, a prototype in 28, yes. and, but the plan to go to 22 FDX. Yes. When, when will you be on F 22 FDX? Yeah, it, it is actually. So this prototype here, this was 28, and this mm -hmm. chip we taped out at the beginning of this year. This is now back from manufacturing. We start the lab evaluation right now. This is a test chip containing art, uh, eight ARM cores and some hardware features like the body bias thing to have a prototype. And this then is to be scaled to the Spinnaker 2 chip, tape out planned early 2020. Okay, let's thank the speaker.